Wonderful time to come to the table of the Lord, isn't it? Always feels refreshing and cleansing and uh, renewing. I trust it is for you as well. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Disciples, temptation to sin, temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. Father, Thank you for this word. We pray that you will open our hearts to understand it more thoroughly and to be willing to obey it as we go. Challenging things in these next few verses, really, as we have found all the way through this book, but um, particularly applicable here. And so we pray that our hearts will be open. Lord, just by your grace, cause us to be people of grace. Bless those who are not able to be with us this morning because they're traveling. We keep pray for safety for them. For those who are anticipating family and friend gatherings, we pray that there will be sweet times around uh, family and friends, but also around you, fellowship in Christ. Pray for those who are in far places serving you. Think of Teresa as she gathers her support. We think of the Losies as they try and determine what's next as Daniel continues to improve. We pray for continued improvement for this little guy and to keep him on his feet and going. Pray for all of our missionaries, Father, wherever they're located, especially those that are right here in our church, Kelly and Jesse and Melissa and Kurt, as they minister in various ways. We just pray that you will bless the work that they're doing as they try and spread your word in the gospel among those who are from far places in the earth. Lord, we thank you that we can have a little part. We pray that you will help us to do that faithfully. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated and uh, please turn with me to Luke 17 if you're not already there. 17th chapter of Luke. Sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes lack of humility is not hard to spot. I think of uh, Mark Cuban, the owner of the Dallas Mavericks. Not long ago, somebody asked him, uh, you know, what his belief was about eternal life and so on. And, well, he, he believes in reincarnation or something like that. And they asked him, well, what do you want to come back as? He says, well, when I die, I want to come back as me. Uh, not a lot of humility there. Or the guy who wrote the book, you know, Humility and How I Achieved It. Uh, probably not a lot of humility there. You're a little slow this morning. Are you with me? I know it's the 4th of July weekend. Let's, you know, I got to get you ready here. All right. So it's, uh, sometimes it's blatant and out in the open, right? But sometimes it's hidden just below the surface. And I think that's what's going on in this passage of Scripture. These first 10 verses of Luke 17, they, they kind of seem like isolated instances, three little things thrown together, almost it seems like at random. But I don't think they are. I think Luke had a, he, he was a very purposeful writer. And I think what he's trying to show us here is three different devastating effects of lack of humility. And so in verses one through four, he's going to show us how humility, lack of humility scandalizes others we'll look at today. In verses 5 and 6, how lack of humility scandalizes God. And in verses 7 through 10, how lack of humility scandalizes self. Humility. Tough thing to come by, right? As soon as you think you've got it, you don't, right? And so, something that we have to work on constantly. Now, the key to the passage, I think, is verse 3. Pay attention to yourselves. But there's a big question around that. And the question is, when Jesus says, pay attention to yourselves, does that link to 
a warning against causing others to stumble that we find in verses one and two, or does it lead into the warning against not forgiving that we find in verse four? Which one does it really go with? Well, I think the answer is, I think Jesus put it in the middle for a reason. <laughs> I think what he's saying to his disciples is that they could easily err either by giving offense, that is causing others to stumble, or they could err by taking offense, by refusing to forgive. In either case, his advice is pay attention to yourselves. Watch out how you respond. Make sure that your response is one of grace before God. And that lack of humility is not bringing scandal into your life. That's the key. So I think this morning I'd like to look at the first part of that, verses one through four, lack of humility scandalizes others. Now, first of all, we have to look at the word scandal. Where in the world does that word come from? Don't see it in the text. Well, Jesus has just warned the Pharisees that hell is filled with well-meaning people who didn't pay attention to the explicit teaching of the Word of God, who wound it around to mean whatever they wanted it to mean rather than really studying out and understanding what it truly meant and missing the point. They wanted signs, exotic signs. Jesus warned against that. But now he turns to his disciples. So now he's looking not just at the whole crowd, but he's paying particular attention to those who are his followers, to those who are believers. And he says to them that they must not be like the Pharisees in another way, in leading others astray. And he starts with a very strong statement there in verse one, temptations to sin are sure to come. Temptations to sin are sure to come. All of us would probably stick our hand up and say, yeah, boy, do I know that, right? Now, usually the word temptation is a translation of the Greek word perosmos. We've seen it in Luke 4, if you were with us when we were way back there in Luke 4, or some of you were with the study when we did James 1. That's the same word that's used in all those places. So this is a different, but this is a different word that he uses here. This is the word skandalos, the Greek word skandalos. We, you can tell right away, we get our word scandal from that. It originally meant, it was a word that meant the bait that you put in a trap. Thus kind of the root meaning of it is an, a, an attractive enticement to destruction. <laughs> Whatever you see in the trap looks so good, right? But it only leads to entrapment. It only leads to your destruction if you follow it. Thus it came to mean, the word scandalous came to mean a stumbling block. A stumbling block. That's what the the primary meaning of this word is, something that others tripped over. And so the word that Jesus used that's translated temptations here, I think would be better translated stumbling blocks. Stumbling blocks are sure to come. So he's saying there are gonna be occasions and there are gonna be events that lead others to stumble. But now you gotta notice the next phrase. The next phrase says, but woe to the one through whom they come. So... People can be stumbling blocks. People can be stumbling blocks. We can trip others up and Jesus pronounces a curse on those who do so. That takes this subject to a whole new level, doesn't it? It reminds us that we will not only answer for our own sin and be accountable for that, but we will also answer for the events in our lives where we have caused others to go astray, to sin, where we have tripped them up in some way. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not responsible. They are. Just like you're responsible for somebody because somebody tripped you up doesn't mean that you're not responsible. You are. We have personal responsibility. But here Jesus makes clear that we are also responsible if we have been a cause of stumbling to someone else. And that's a serious thing to think about, is it not? I got enough trouble just thinking about me. But now I got to worry about, am I causing others to stumble? Jesus goes on in verse two, it would be better for him if that millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea. 
than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin, literally, to be scandalized. It's the same word that's used in verse one. To stumble. So you see what he's getting at here. Now, if he didn't get your attention before, he's trying to make sure he does in verse two. What's, what's the millstone? The millstone is that gigantic piece of rock that they used to grind grain in those days, right? And there would be a hole in the middle of it that would tie a donkey to and they'd make this thing go around in a circle. And he's saying, if you take one of those huge things, tie a rope around one of it, one end of it through the middle of its, through the hole in the middle, and then tie that around your neck and then throw in, you're thrown into the sea, it would be better if that happened to you than if you cause somebody to stumble. I don't think any of us would want that to happen, right? That would be a bad day, right? But he says it'd be better for you if that happened. He's warning us that there is trouble ahead for one who is causing others to stumble. This is what's coming your way if you cause others to stumble. Jesus issues a similar warning in Matthew 23, verse 15 to the Pharisees. He warns them that their hypocrisy is not only leading them to hell, but in the process, they are leading others to hell as well. But here he's reminding us that the hypocrisy of a true believer could do the same thing. Because those Pharisees were not really true believers, but but Christian people could have a devastating effect on others as well, and Jesus wants to know it. And not only is he addressing believers here as the ones who could be the cause of stumbling, but look at this. The ones that they cause to stumble here are these little ones. These little ones. Now, the word that he uses there for little ones could mean children, physically, physical children, and undoubtedly they are partly in view here. That's why I think he would use this word. But it's got a broader meaning than this. The parallel passage to this in the, in, in the Gospel of Mark, Mark 9, verse 42. Here's how it reads there. Mark 9, 42, he says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin. So what he's saying is someone who is a little one is one who is little in their faith. They're a child in their faith. They're probably a new believer or maybe they're an older believer that's just never grown up, but they're weak in their faith. Perhaps they've never been taught. Perhaps they've been taught, but they have not really been obedient, not very obedient, even though they are a true believer. And so he's warning here that believers could lead other believers astray. Now, if it's true that a believer could lead another believer astray, the end result can't be hell because they're believers, but there could be severe penalty and severe loss attached to the judgment of those who are in this category. In other words, beloved, he's talking to us. We will answer not only for our own misdeeds, but for others who have stumbled over us. So that's where the word scandalize comes from, stumbling block. But now we need to ask the question, well, how could we scandalize someone else as a believer? How could we do that? And I'm, you know, I'm almost tempted to say it's such a big subject, how do we take it on? There are a million ways we could scandalize each other, right? A million ways we could cause each other to stumble. I'm going to list just a few today. In fact, we're taking most of the rest of the time today to talk about that. But just a few that they're just representative examples. They'll realize, and if I don't hit you, (laughs) sorry, um, but you'll you'll have your own that you can figure out by way of application. So how do we scandalize others? Well, how about number one, false teaching? False teaching would lead people astray, would it not? I mean, that's such an obvious one. If we teach people wrongly what the Bible is saying, we could certainly lead them astray. The Pharisees' legalism led people directly away from Christ instead of to him, directly away from the Messiah that they had all been anticipating, directly away from him instead of toward him. 
but we can do the same. Peter says, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Beware, beloved. Just because somebody says the name God or throws out the name Jesus doesn't mean that they're a true teacher of God. He says, there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Now, in the context in which Peter is writing, the, these false teachers are almost certainly unbelievers. But there could be true believers who are false teachers, true believers who have not really studied the Word of God, true believers who have their own agenda that they are trying to teach. Well-intentioned, perhaps, in some cases. In other cases, perhaps doing it just for money or something else. But they are false teachers. They have misinterpreted the Scripture. That's why, that's why the Bible encourages this. I mean, that's why you've got to check out everything, including everything I say, please. And come back and question. So I do everything I can to get this word right because I'm aware of what James says. James in chapter three, verse one, he says, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. It's an awesome responsibility to stand and teach the word of God. Those of you who are teachers of children, guess what? You're teachers. You could be subject to the same thing. You could be causing them to stumble. The Bible is not a series of moral lessons. It's a series of lessons to teach us who God is. Let me give you one example. Rob Bell, he's a believer, I think. But he's one who is so anxious to avoid any stigma of hell that in his book, Love Wins, he basically hints forcefully that everybody in the end will be saved. We'll all make it. Or at least, everybody will have a second chance after they die. Would you like to believe that? I'd like to believe that. Is it true to Scripture? Not even close. Beloved, the Bible says, Hebrews 10, verse 27, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. The parable we just had in Luke 16, what did, it say, what did it tell us about the rich man? He died, he lifted up his eyes in hell, and there was a great gulf fixed between him and heaven that he couldn't get. What do you think the message is there? How can you miss that? False teaching, misrepresenting the word of God. A book crossed my desk just the other day, suggesting that hell is uh, hell's an awful place, but it's not eternal. People just go there and they're annihilated. People who reject Christ do not have an eternal future away from Christ. They are simply annihilated there. But what does Jesus say? Jesus said that hell is a place, quote, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, Mark 9, 48. Revelation 14, 11 says, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever. And listen, it does not give me joy to teach these things, beloved, but this is, this is the authority is the Bible. To misrepresent what the Bible has to say would be to cause people to stumble. It makes me wonder how many people have stumbled because of what Rob Bell has taught that is not, that is not Scripture, have been victimized. So we can scandalize people by not being faithful to what the Word says. How about another one? How about violating someone's conscience? Bible speaks to this more than one place, but let me just give you one. We're going to look up a couple passages in a moment. But let me just read this. This is from Romans 14. You can look it up later. Romans 14, verse 13. Paul says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance. That's our word, scandalos. Never put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. 
I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. What he's, what he's saying is there are some things that are not sin to you. But if you do them, they are sin to your brother because it violates his conscience or your sister. He's saying, for if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love. By what you eat, you destroy the one for whom Christ died. Your freedom can be the cause of stumbling for another person. He's, he's basically the same thing here as he is in 1 Corinthians where he talks about meat offered to idols, right? And they were wondering, well, is there anything wrong with, uh, with eating meat offered to idols? And Paul's basically saying, no, it's cheaper, so why wouldn't you eat it? But what's the problem? The problem is those who have been in that idolatry and have come out of that and, and, and seen what the evil is that attaches to that whole system can't eat that with good conscience. So if you come before them and you eat it before them and you sort of throw it in their face, you're at fault, you're causing them to stumble. Now, we don't have cheap meat offered to idols that I'm aware of that is a problem here, but how about the glass of wine that you're drinking in front of a sister or a brother who's offended by it or someone who has a drinking problem? How about the movie that you're going to that you think is fine, but somebody else is scandalized by it? Beloved, there are a million ways that we could scandalize each other by violating one another's conscience. How else could we cause people to stumble? How about failure to fellowship? Failure to fellowship. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24, and let us... Consider how to stir one another up to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some. So they had church skippers in ancient times as well. But encouraging one another. See, here's the deal. When we don't fellowship regularly with believers, we don't, we don't make it to church or small group or wherever else our place of fellowship with other believers is, we not only are robbing ourselves because we certainly are doing that, this is what stirs us up to love and good works. It's to be with others who believe like we do. It's to be encouraged in the faith. It's to be challenged at times because we need that. But we're not only missing that, we're robbing someone else. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 12, 7, you've been gifted to edify, to build up others. So not only are you losing out, but somebody else who is there who needs the gift that you have on that particular day, on that particular occasion, is being robbed. And you are therefore a cause of stumbling. Because you're not there, you're not using the giftedness that God has given you. Say, wow, you're meddling this morning. Listen, wait, hang on, you haven't heard anything yet. So <laughs> stay with me. We all need grace, beloved. We need to know that. We need grace. Here's another one, Matthew 16. Turn with me to this one. We, we do, the, we, you know, we, <laughs> this is Peter. And we love to look at Peter and say, oh, what a dummy Peter was. We don't realize how many different ways we are doing the same thing. Matthew 16. Jesus has told his disciples he's headed to Jerusalem to suffer, to die, and to rise again. And Peter has risen to the occasion and said, he pulled him aside and he said, Lord, not on my watch. This is not going to happen. Now while I'm around, you don't need to worry about it. But look at Matthew 16, verse 23. 16, 23. But he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance, scandalous. You are a hindrance to me. Why? Because you are setting your mind, you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. So here's Peter. He's not just scandalizing any believer. He's not just a stumbling block to anybody. He's a stumbling block to Jesus, potentially. He is following 
the dictates of his own mind and what he thinks to be right instead of what God has already said is going to be right. Man would say, don't die. What can you do if you die? Death is the worst thing there is. Don't die. But from God's perspective, the worst thing that could have happened on this occasion would have been what? Would have been for Jesus not to die. We wouldn't be here today. There would be no redemption, no forgiveness, no cleansing, no anything, for, no hope if Jesus hadn't died, right? God knew that. Peter didn't know that. And so he followed the way that seemed right to a man, which always leads to destruction. Obedience, beloved, is always best. Caring for God's concerns more than ours is always going to be the best. And we're not very strong at that, are we? How does it look when we have all kinds of time to follow our hobbies and our pursuits and our television and our video games and our, and our, and our, and our sports, but we have no time to join a ministry team to minister to those who are in need, perhaps our widows or the elderly or people in our community who are in need. How does that, how does that, are we following the ways of man or the ways of God when we do that? What does it say to our little ones, our own children, when we have the latest and greatest in cars and furniture and appliances and doodads, while great mission-minded people like Jason and Nicole Spears, like in our own church, Kelly and Jesse Griffin and Kurt and Melissa Adams, go with minimal financial needs unmet. And nobody paid me to make an announcement this morning, okay? But I know their needs. And I know what goes on. And how can we look ourselves in the face and say, I'm following the ways of God and not the ways of man when that's going on. Just ask. If you have children, does your selection of how you spend Sunday mornings reflect that your mind is on the things of God or on the things of man? It's a big question. It's a big question in our society. It's a big question in our little town of Eden. Because it gives us lots of things other than the things of God to be concerned about on Sunday mornings. A million ways to scandalize our kids. Listen, when was the last time your kids heard you pray for our missionaries or pray for persecuted Christians? When was the last time your kids heard you pray, period? Beloved, you can't be a Christian parent and you're not praying with and for your children. You're just fooling yourself. The things of God are the things that we are to be concerned with. And when we're more concerned with the things of man, we are stumbling someone. When was the last time that our kids saw us give up something we wanted in order to provide for someone who was in need? Ephesians 6, 4 says, do not provoke your children to anger. Done that lately? Doesn't mean you don't discipline them. But it means you are very careful about how you do that. That you speak the truth with love. They may be stumbled by the way you approach them. Now listen, beloved, we, none of us get this perfect. The idea here isn't to bury you this morning under guilt. But the idea is to encourage you in a positive direction toward the will of God because that's what will be best for him and best for you. We scandalize each other when we are paying attention to the ways of man more than the ways of God. Grace covers our failures, beloved, but it also points us to that which is right. It does. And young people, you don't get off the hook here, right? Every act of disobedience, where are they? I'm looking at them. Every act of disrespect, whether your parents are right or wrong, guess what? It's a cause of scandalous. It's a cause of stumbling. And you got younger brothers and sisters watching. You have a great privilege 
to be living a grace-filled Christian life rather than a stumbling block, scandalous life. So we scandalize when we chase the ways of man instead of the ways of God. Here, what's another one? How about sexual misconduct, physical or mental? Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. God says this to all of us. 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 4. He says that he wants each of us to know how to control our body in holiness and honor and not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one transgress or wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an adventure of all these things. As we've told you before and solemnly warn you, for God has called us for impure, for, not for impurity, but in holiness. And he gives a specific example when you go back to verse three, for this is the will of God. Listen, you wanna know the will of God for your life? Young people, you're always worried about the will of God for your life, right? Which you should be. What does God want me to do? Where does he want me to go? Well, listen, here's a direct statement of the will of God for your life. Look at it. Here is the will of God for you, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. What is that? The word is porneia. Any sexual relationship outside of marriage. And Jesus, you you will remember, broadened that to me, not just the physical act, but the thought life. How many Christian young men have led Christian young ladies into temptation instead of honoring them? How often has that happened? They become a stumbling block. Young ladies, older ladies, all of you ladies, not to let you off the hook, does your dress scandalize? Is it a cause of stumbling? Just because the society says it's okay. And you should look this way. What does the Lord say? Let your moderation be known to all men. Now you got to figure out where that line is. But what you have to understand is for us guys, it's probably not, as, not where you think it is. We can, I know I'm really meddling now, right? I told you. It's going to get worse. I warned you. Okay, so here you are. Same is true of the, you know, the innocent flirtations and the the lustful thought life that some of us indulge in of married people, because whether it's being acted out or not, some partner is being deprived, scandalized, robbed of their dignity, and encouraged to sin in their own right. Sexual misconduct. How about another way we scandalize each other by insisting on one's own rights? We've been memorizing Philippians 2 for a reason, right? Because it's warning us about that. And we've seen those in verses 1 and 2 that we've already read, but verses 3 and 4 that we're now just starting on, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That's, have you thought about what that really means? Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Listen, I'm fully aware, and I know that there are times when we have to take a stand. When there is a moral issue, when there is an issue of theology, where the basic, fundamental teaching of the Bible with regard to salvation is being attacked, we need to take a stand. But, beloved, that's different than when, you know, the color on the wall is being, you know, discussed. Or whether we should have a church van or not, or whatever the discussion is that takes us off on tangents of name-calling and backbiting and devouring one another. We're a cause of stumbling when we do that, when we insist on our own way, scandal once again, and we have to dig deep to see if we're involved. How about the refusal to forgive? So the last one we'll look at. Some of you are saying thank you, <laughs> right? Just remember, beloved, I preach these to me before I get to you, and then I have to hear it again. 
And then long after you've forgotten it, I still remember. If God's not working on the preacher first, it's not going to be any good, right? It's true. Refusal to forgive, perhaps the biggest of all. Verse 3, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, then you must forgive him. Listen, we give offense by taking offense. Harboring grudges. We foster sin by our failure to forgive. We harbor grudges and harden our hearts by, har by, by harboring grudges. We violate the rights of Christ in order to protect our own. I, 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 I wish, I hope, I... I'm still trying to learn this one, but when I'm defending my own rights, most likely, do you realize I'm violating the rights of Christ? Most likely. It's not always true, but most likely. And yet we've been taught, you must defend your rights. If you don't defend your rights, who's going to defend them? Well, I'll tell you who will. Jesus will. He says, leave the vengeance to me, Romans 12, 19. I'll take care of it. You're not in the vengeance business. You're stepping onto my territory the minute you harbor a grudge, the minute you harbor bitterness. How easy it is to do. We give offense by take, taking offense. And listen, Jesus' bar is high. I'm sure you noticed this. Seven times in one day for the same offense is a lot of times to forgive, isn't it? I'd be lucky if I could forgive you seven times during the course of a month, let alone in the course of a day for the same thing. I mean, by time number three, I'm saying this guy doesn't really mean this. They're not truly asking forgiveness. This is a joke. Jesus says you must forgive. I'll sort out the genuineness. I'll sort out any vengeance that needs to be taken. I'll straighten this out. You're not called to do that. That's my job. So you need to forgive. You need to wipe the slate clean as far as you're concerned. You've been wronged? Wipe the slate. Now, I'm, I'm sure many of you have spotted the loophole, right? If he repents, forgive him. There's the loophole. But if he doesn't, all bets are off, right? There's an if there, right? Is there an if in your Bible? There's an if in my Bible. It says it right there. If he repents, then forgive. But if he doesn't, oh boy. <laughs> Got him now, right? If there's no repentance. Well, as you would expect, I'm going to show you this loophole isn't quite as big as you think it is, okay? Now, you have to follow me here because this is subtle, but I really think it's true to Scripture, so we have to be careful with that, quote, loophole. Note that the first thing Jesus says is this. He says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Rebuke him. Now, the first thing you need to know about that is, he says, if your brother sins. This is not, this is not when you get every little irritation, okay? There are such things as irritation that don't require forgiveness. They just require something else. They require forbearance. Forbearance means to overlook it. It doesn't require forgiveness because there hasn't been any sin. There's personality quirks. They're all over this auditorium, right? And because we're different, we think differently, we act differently, and we come at each other differently, and we misinterpret each other, right? That is not a cause for rebuke or for sin or the need for forgiveness. It's a re it requires the need for forbearance. It's another exercise in humility. Paul mentions that in Ephesians 4. Verses one through three, he says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So what does that mean? Well, that means to bear with, to overlook. It means when they walked right past you with saying hello, you just say, okay, well, so they walked right past me. It means when somebody else gets attention, but you don't, and they overlook you, you, you forbear. To forbear is to overlook. You know, maybe they're, ha you don't know what happened. You don't know, that maybe they're just having a bad day. Maybe their personality is just different than yours. Maybe their husband or wife hollered at them all the way to church. You don't know. You don't know. So you forbear. It's an act of humility to forbear. They didn't give you what you deserve, so you forbear with them. Forbearance. 
But if you have, what if you truly have been wronged? What if there really is a sin? And Jesus says, rebuke you, or, or rebuke them. And you're thinking, wow, right on, let me at them. I'll straighten them out. You know what? If that's what you're thinking, the sin is on you. Because that's not what rebuke is. It isn't even close to what rebuke is. Turn with me to Galatians 6. Galatians 6. If you've been with us long enough and your Bible opens automatically to Ephesians, you just have to turn back a page, right? Galatians 6. Galatians 6 and verse 1. Here's rebuke. Watch this. I'll tell you what, after you read this, you'll probably be a lot less anxious to do rebuke, (laughs) although the Lord gives you the right to do it. But listen to this. Brothers, sisters, if anyone's caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself. wonder where he got that phrase. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted Oh, man. Listen, rebuke takes a lot of humility, beloved, when it's done right. And it always confronts with the idea of restoration, never with the idea of setting someone straight. If that's what's in your mind and that's what's in your heart, you can't go there. Well, I mean, you can, but you'll be sinning. You'll be as much a sinner as the person that you think you're correcting. Rebuke, let me tell you what rebuke requires. Now listen carefully, because there's the subtleness. Rebuke requires that you first have already forgiven the person. In your own mind, you've already wiped the slate clean. You're not holding it against them anymore. In, in order to rebuke someone, you've already turned it over to the Lord. Any vengeance, anything else that's needed, you're, you've trusted it to the Lord to take care of, and you said, okay, that's over to you. But I see that this person is is sinning and I see that that it's an offense and I see that it needs to be addressed and I'm willing willing to do that. I'm willing to ask them if they wouldn't like to see that this is wrong and repent and be restored to fellowship. But you've already canceled the dead in your own heart. Listen, you can't rebuke someone to restore them if you haven't already forgiven them. You can't do it. You're not charging it to their account anymore. You say, well, okay, I hear you, but Jesus still says if he repents, then forgive him. And that is what Jesus says, isn't it? But let me give you another way of looking at this that I hope will help. There are two sides to forgiveness because there are two parties involved, at least. And so there are two sides to forgiveness. Full reconciliation requires the cooperation of both sides, right? The person who has committed the offense has to repent. The person who has been offended against has to forgive. Until you get both of those, you can't have reconciliation. But what you can have and what you must have is forgiveness, whether or not there is repentance. What Jesus is saying is if there is repentance, then you cannot ever withhold your forgiveness. You must let it blossom and you must let it bloom. But as we've already seen, you can't have the possibility and the experience of rebuking someone if you've not already in your own heart canceled the offense, canceled the charge against that person. You say, how do you know that's true? Well, because, I, because it's in Scripture. I, I mean, I point you for, for the first example to Christ on the cross. What was one of the seven things that he said on the cross? Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Forgive them. Now let me ask you, had they repented? Are you kidding? They're still putting the nails in his hands, right? They're slamming the cross down into the ground. There's no repentance going on and yet Jesus says, forgive them. There was no reconciliation there at that point in time. Now, thankfully, I think a few of those people, I don't know how many, but a few of them probably came to Christ as Savior later on. So there was reconciliation, but it started. It started with the redemptive message of Jesus. Father, forgive them. And you find the same thing in the life of Stephen 
as he's being stoned to death, Father, forgive them? Any repentance on their part? I don't think so. Have you ever asked yourself this question? Because there was a young man there watching the stoning that day, right, whose name was Saul. Remember that? He held the coats for all the rest of the guys who were throwing the stones. That man later got converted. He became the apostle Paul, right? But on that day, he was right there at the stoning of... Have you ever asked yourself, is it possible that one of the reasons that Paul ever got saved was because he watched Stephen say, Father, forgive them? Is, in fact, Paul possibly an answer to Stephen's prayer, Father, forgive them? Have you ever asked yourself that? The human instrumentality in the salvation of the Apostle Paul may well have been Stephen who was holding the coats that day. How about David who was wronged by, by Saul continuously and yet, and yet he continually forgave him? Same must be true of us, beloved. Forgiveness cannot come to full bloom until both parties come together, but we never, ever have a license to withhold forgiveness or to hold a grudge until someone repents that is never taught in the Bible. And I preach to myself first that we must forgive. And then we forgive again and then we forgive again and forgive again and forgive again and forgive again and forgive again. And that's just day one. Right? Seven times. First day. Where does it end? 490 times. 70 times seven, that's what Jesus told Peter later on, right? But I don't think he meant 490 times. He was just saying infinitely. Just the way I've forgiven you. As I have forgiven you, so you must forgive others. Isn't that what we pray in the Lord's Prayer? This, is, this message is a challenge, is it not? To those who are seeking to follow Christ, we have to ask ourselves, who am I taking along to danger by the way that I live? Sin is, sin is almost never in isolation. Almost always affects somebody else. So we have to ask ourselves, who am I exposing to danger by the way that I am living? By my care for the things of the world instead of the things of God. Who am I exposing to danger? Who am I exposing to danger by protecting my own rights instead of his? Who am I exposing to danger? You know, during World War II, there was an interesting event. D-Day approached July, June 6, 1944. Winston Churchill, 70-year-old Prime Minister of Great Britain, right, who was an activist, if there ever was one, was absolutely determined that he was going to go with the troops on D-Day for the landing on the shores of France. He was going to go along. And General Eisenhower didn't think that was a good idea. He thought, he thought that Churchill alive was better than Churchill dead on some beach in France. The problem was Churchill outranked Eisenhower. So Eisenhower did an end around. He went to King George VI, who outranked Churchill. And he said, I got a problem. Churchill wants to go along on this invasion. It's not a wise idea. Can you stop him? And the king said, yeah, I think I can stop him. So what did he do? He didn't issue an order. What he did was he went to Churchill and he said, hey, Winston, I hear that you're going along on the invasion. He said, if the prime minister's going, you know what, I think the king ought to be going too. Please make provision for me to be on the ship, right? Churchill knew he'd been outflanked. He gave it up. He wasn't willing to lead his king into danger. Let me ask you, who are you... Who are, you, who are you willing to lead into danger by the way you're living your life? What kind of attitudes, what kind of actions, what kind of decisions are you taking that are leading those around you into temptation? How are you scandalizing others? By the grace of God, let him go to work in your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the words. I pray that you will... Dismiss anything that was successive, anything that wasn't true to the word, but Lord, everything that is, I pray that you will bring it home to us. Help us to realize that what we are doing truly has an effect on others. It'll either draw them to you or it'll, or it'll turn them away. 
That's believers and unbelievers both. Now this passage was basically believer to believer, but of course we do the same with our unbelieving friends and neighbors and family. Help us, please, to be the shining lights that you ask us to be so that people will see us and glorify our Father and glorify us, but glorify the God who is motivating us. Lord, I pray that first of all for my, and most of all for my own life. And I pray it for each life here this morning as well. I pray it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.